Well, first of all, this b- brings up the prime of Miss Jean Brody every other week. I was going to say, have, you, have so, you been paying attention? I have a problem where I can't stop bringing it up. I think she's my actual teacher at this point. And we are back for an all-new episode of Keep It. I'm Ira, baby girl Madison the Third. Oh, somebody has seen the new Nicole Kidman trailer with Harris Dickens' son, and I better be the son. Uh, I'm Louis Vertel, and this is uh, another uh, episode of Keep It where the theme is Guess Who Died? Because, by the way, they all fucking died this week, including an all-timer, somebody I've touted a thousand times on the show, and you'd be crazy not to be at least somewhat comprehensive about her career if you're a pop culture fan. The great Maggie Smith died. Uh, over the weekend. And you know what I'll say, Ira? This is not a Jenna Rowland situation where if people reference the one movie they've heard of regarding her recently, it does not undercut her career. Because if you only know her from Harry Potter or only know her from Hook or Downton Abbey, she still is giving an A-plus prestige performance in those things. So it's fair to say you understand the greatness of Maggie Smith, even if those are your few references. But by the way, if those are your few references, you suck. Don't listen to the podcast. You're not invited. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's not for you. <laughs> if you only know, honestly, if you only know her from her Graham Norton performance, yeah. so, <laughs> that, uh, then you are, you're miles ahead. That's true. Well, also, <laughs> she is one of those people like uh, Kate Blanchett or Betty Davis or uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn, where in addition to being phenomenal actors, they were also, for some reason, unbelievably funny. Like, this is not a writer. Why is Maggie Smith so funny just casually? Uh, unfortunately, it's been a sad week. Yeah, we get these weeks occasionally here on Keep It, where we have to do some memorializing, and we will, so fear not. Okay, so after I learned that Maggie Smith passed away, first of all, I woke up from a nap and found out that Maggie Smith passed away and it was a sort of sort of weird dream sort of scape. And I was like, what is going on? People were just sort of sharing things about Harry Potter in a group text and also Downton Abbey. And I was like, what is going on here? And then I discovered that Maggie Smith had passed away. And then someone was in my DMs saying, I hope you and Lewis share some projects that she's been in, you know, to give us a comprehensive um, guide to Maggie Smith films that aren't just Downton Abbey and the Harry Potter films. And I was like, well, first of all, this bitch brings up the prime of Miss Jean Brody every other week. I was going to say, have you you been paying attention? I have a problem where I can't stop bringing it up. I think she's my actual teacher at this point. So that, first of all, is one of the main Keep It films that is in the canon. Yes. Along with Eve's Bayou and whatever else we always talk about. But Maggie Smith is, uh, she's everywhere, I feel like. In, in the sense that she truly has been in popular culture for such a long time. And I, what I've had the joy of discovering, I guess, is how many things she was in prior to um, her American career renaissance oh jesus i mean like first of all uh let's talk about the two oscars okay prime of miss jean brody during the pandemic this is a movie i watched rewatched, and among all the movies i watched over the pandemic and i watched everything and everything it is the single most addicting film i've seen i have now seen it probably 15 times um uh it's the it, basically it's the inspiration for dead poet society if you've ever seen that with robin williams but it's nothing like that this is a movie where you start off and you think it's going to be a mr holland's opus type film where this teacher has a certain air about them and they're going to be in- inspirational and you know um there's something kind of crazy about them but we love it and it's addicting and the kids come out enriched it is a much darker film than that and it's about this woman who is in fact a wild extreme narcissist with fascist tendencies but she also in her own way is motherfucking fabulous and delivering these one-liners where you think well shit maybe i'm a fascist too if it's gonna be this fucking fun i mean like it's she's so uh, it's a bewildering and complex characterization it gets darker and the students become sort of on to her and they turn on her but um it was a celebrated stage role before that vanessa redgrave played it uh uh in london first and then it became a tony winning performance for zoe caldwell here And then Maggie Smith played the um, theatrical version. I can honestly say, after Vivian Lee's two Best Actress Oscar wins, this is my third favorite Best Actress performance of all time. And she beats Jane Fonda in my favorite Jane Fonda performance in They Shoot Horses, Don't They? So for me to say that, I have to, like, gulp a bit to admit it. 
But the one the one liners in this movie are just unbelievable. She it could be played by nobody else. People don't understand that when RuPaul on RuPaul's Drag Race says "Bring back my gals," the way she he says "girls" is taken from Maggie Smith in the prime of Miss Jean Brody, who has this Scottish sort of uh, verve with everything she says. Uh, please just watch it and come back and I, I, I swear you'll be obsessed with this movie even though every time a man comes on screen I am so fucking pissed they are there they are the most loathsome characters <laughs> um, the second Oscar yeah. we have to talk about oh, California is Sweet one of, yes. one of my favorite Neil Simons uh, and I know that you're not a big Neil Simon aficionado you right. don't love him that much but California Sweet is to me a fantastic film that thrives because the actors in it are fucking phenomenal. I yes. mean, you have Jane Fonda in it, Ellen Alda, Michael Caine, his scenes with Maggie Smith uh, in this film, they're so fucking funny yeah. in oh, this. God. And just watching them go back and forth in the hotel room with each other, there's a moment where she she throws something at him and where he sort of like jumps up and there's a reflection like in the mirror of her it's their back and forth is almost theatrical um, like you could be watching it on stage and their comedic timing is just so perfect and it's Truly one of my favorite performances of hers. Yeah, so California Suite is a lot like Neil Simon's Plaza Suite, where it's different stories centered around one location. And it starts with Ellen Alda and Jane Fonda. It's also better. Yeah, you, oh, yes. Yeah, debatable. But um, there's a whole section with Richard Pryor and Bill Cosby, which is definitely the worst part of the movie. And then you get this segment with Michael Caine and Maggie Smith, where she is an Oscar nominee. And she's waiting for the ceremony. And uh, she's with her bisexualish companion, uh, Michael Caine, and they have this like knowing relationship, a, a, a relationship of convenience. And you know, Neil Simon on occasion is funny for real, but truly, it takes these unbelievable talents to make it uproariously funny. And just the degree of difficulty of getting this performance in the Oscars conversation, let alone to a win, should tell you how talented she is. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, around that time, she's in other movies like Evil Under the Sun, which is uh, one of the great Hercule Poirot uh, movies starring the great uh, Peter Ustinov. Uh, she's in this movie called Travels with My Aunt in the early 70s, where she she's this like kind of uh, wild, anti-mame figure who takes this uh, her nephew out on this journey. And this is the first time she's messing with our perceptions of her age, because she is 37 in this movie. And it was supposed to be Katherine Hepburn, who was in her 60s by that point. But... Uh, Maggie Smith plays older, and you simply believe it. Like in Hook, she plays Robin Williams' mother, and she's like 10 years older than he is. And as she said herself, she could no longer keep doing Downton Abbey because by the time they left that character off, she would have been 110. So uh, <laughs> she was all ages at all times, and it's actually very um, sort of telling that her signature role, Jean Brody, is somebody who's insisting on being in her prime the entire time She's on screen and she's in her mid 30s in that movie because there was never a time in Maggie Smith's career she was not in her prime. She was always this sharp talent. You watch um, Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, that role could be nobody else. By the way, I had somehow missed these films. Yeah. I had never seen a single Marigold Hotel film until this weekend. And so I watched them. And I was, it was a pleasure to know that they were directed by the iconic director of Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. So I knew it was in for a treat. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> when I discovered that this woman was playing the most racist, racist? bitch that you have ever seen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on camera, <laughs> I was like, oh, this is where we're going here. Yeah. Uh, she starts out just so fantastic in this film, and she's marvelous in them uh so great to watch and i had made a funny reference honestly the day she died i'd made a reference to um the day before she died i'd made a reference to death on the nile for some reason and so it was surprising then to find out that she died the next day but i love that film and i also love <laughs> othello oh my where god if you want to see Lawrence olivier in blackface Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. Does that even count as blackface given what they put him in? What material did we use? It's like not close to correct. Like it's so strange looking. But uh, yes, that's a very kind of stodgy Shakespearean ad adaptation uh, that 1965 Othello. That was her first Oscar nomination of six. Um, definitely see her in Gosford Park, which is a uh, murder mystery. Maybe the best Altman movie to me, the most entertaining one, the one I come back 
the most times to watch. And that's where you get signature Maggie Smith, where just ruining someone's day with a single one-liner. You know, just le- leaning yeah. in and, like, cocking the head and, oh, did you just speak? Well, I'm going to say one thing and you're ended. Like, just ending – that Downton Abbey thing. And basically, Downton Abbey is a, a TV series adaptation of Gosford Park. Um, Julian Fellows uh, originated. Pl- I mean, please. She's just one of the greatest actresses of of all time. And uh, and you know what I'll say? If you haven't seen Tea with the Dames, which is a, a documentary about her and friends Judy Dench – uh, Eileen Atkins and Joan Plowright, they're sitting around this kind of rambling estate where, that they've had for so years. So funny. Yeah, it's just 80 minutes. It's just them kind of recalling things like knowing Lawrence Olivier and uh, how Judy Dench gets all the parts first and they have to wait and get her scraps. So amusing. And Maggie is just uproarious. Again, why is she so funny? How did this happen? <laughs> yeah. Um, I will lastly say about Maggie Smith that I was pleasantly surprised, actually, that more so than Harry Potter, I actually saw a lot of people bringing up her role in the Sister Act films. Of course, yes. As I said before, there's no such thing as only knowing basic knowledge of Maggie Smith because she brings the prestige to whatever it is. Sister Act, you know, a a lovely three-star comedy. She is just aces in it. Of course, like that mother superior could be nobody else. Yeah, and so we've also got Chris Christopherson, who passed more recently. A wonderful songwriter, not as good an actor, but that is not what we're memorializing today. He yeah, is, you know, yeah. actor, uh, singer, good singer, performer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also Dude. wrote one of the great songs, Me and Bobby McGee, by uh, Janis Joplin, which is just a, a fabulously written song. Yeah, you do not need to run out and see A Star is Born with him and Barbara Streisand. Because you'll never leave. It's still going on now. Yeah. Please. It's like on hour <laughs> six, and she's finally getting to the part where he might die. Yeah. And uh, he's maybe one of the goofiest parts of Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Uh, Ellen burst in seventy four. Uh, you know, Martin Scorsese one time made a movie about a woman. I know it sounds like I'm telling tall tales. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a really good film, and I'm, yeah. I, I really want to know. I really need a documentary on that film, to be honest. Just like a backstory, I need a full interview on that film. And if there's one that exists, someone please direct me to it because I just want to know what was going on in Marty's life at the time where he made this film, and then was like, you know what? No more. We have to bring up Gavin Creel, um, the yeah. unbelievable Tony-winning performer. He won for uh, a featured role for Hello, Dolly a couple years ago, but he died very young, 48, a rare nerve cancer. I think he, I had heard he had figured out something was wrong like two months ago, and since it just passed away, it's very, very shocking. Uh, Gavin Creel, whatever role you know him from, I think – there are people that would argue it's his signature role. He just, everything was nailed, like thoroughly modern, really. I mean, we'll start with that, which is Ira's favorite musical. But Hair also, uh, 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 Into the Woods. So this is somebody who was beloved. I loved hearing Bette Midler's tribute to him after he died. Uh, obviously, they were co-stars in Hello, Dolly. And that might be the the definitive theatrical event of the past 10 years at this point, you know, since Hamilton's, yeah. I think, now more than 10 years ago. I had the pleasure of seeing him on stage so many times. I think the first time I saw him on stage was in Hair, the revival, um, when I first moved to New York. And I think that he's, I mean, he's just such this singular, beautiful voice. And I was obviously, yes, Thoroughly Modern Millie is my favorite musical. So it is not eerie to me that I was listening to the musical earlier in the day. Yeah, when I found out that he passed, uh, because I listen to it all the time, and um, what I think has been maybe sort of comforting um, in his passing was just knowing so many people in the theater community and just seeing how beloved he was. Oh, it keeps coming. People... The remembrances are so touching. Everybody loved him. So seeing people sharing photos, sharing stories, um, and I think. There was a beautiful sort of um, text message that uh, Benj Pasek shared from him uh, that he had gotten recently that just said sort of like, I'm proud of you for living. Not living is one thing I have learned so far during this time that is no longer an option. Ever again, live. If you are alive, live. And obviously he learned about this two months prior, sort of. So to sort of know 
that you have a um, timestamp on your life Ugh. sort of changes your outlook and how you reach out to your friends and family. And um, yeah, I know the, sort of the theater community is hurting right now. Ugh. And he's what a, a great person. Yes, at least we have the numerous recordings from him to know him but also he did whatever that broadway thing is where uh, mismatched or whatever that's called i'm sorry i can't think of it right now oh um, i was literally about yeah. to say his miscast, miscast. with aaron tevitt where he did take me or leave me from rent is one of my favorite performances hands down uh, the, uh, it's instantly rewatchable too it's the kind <laughs> of like performance you want to live inside you don't want it to end um yeah yes uh what a loss I also want to just bring up um, another passing that was sort of like really hit me, but um, Drake Hoggiston, who played John Black on Days of Our Lives, passed away. I mean, you live um, with these people. When you watch soap operas, it's like they yeah. are in your life every day. It's like they were the original podcast people, you know? If you are a person who even grew up with your parents or grandparents or aunts or babysitter watching Days of Our Lives. Mm -hmm. You knew who John Black was. John Black was married to Marlena Evans, played by Deirdre Hall. He'd been on the show since the 80s. He first debuted as Roman Brady on the show uh, as a recast Roman Brady. Then it turned out that Roman Brady had gotten facial surgery by Stefano Demera and his name was really John Black. And then there was years of John Black learning out who he really was and his history and everything. And most recently we got to learn his past um, and we found out his real father and his father was played by Dick Van Dyke on the show oh, recently in might. an arc. Yeah. That was a lovely way to sort of end years of, sort of changed storylines over different head writers over decades of like sort of retconning his bat story. So it was sort of beautiful that his story got to come to a nice, lovely conclusion before um, Drake died. Not that he knew he was dying at that point. It's sort of, um, he died around at 70, just a day before his 71st birthday, actually. And um, this is sort of similar to a Gavin thing, actually. He learned about uh, his illness, uh, his cancer recently, and sort of um, the writers had to sort of scramble and write him out of the show very oh, wow. quickly. So Drake's character will be, John Black will be dying on the show soon. The show taped so far in advance, so John Black will be dying on the show. I assume this is what Dick Van Dyke won his most recent daytime Emmy for. It is. This man, I mean, like, he, and he'll, like, show up at an award show and, like, do one handed push ups. He's like Jack Polance times three. Like, just still, at, like, in his 90s, pounding out this entertainment. So shocking. Yeah. Um, but anyway, if you've ever seen an episode of Days of Our Lives, you know who John Black is. So um, this was a really um, big sort of, like, hit in the gut when I found out that he died. And that concludes our episode of Can You Believe All These People Have Passed Away? <laughs> Every once in a while on Keep It, you know, we, we need to uh, restate our mission statement, which is reminding you who's around and then who isn't. So just be aware that this is us doing our um, really academic work. But like we said earlier in this episode, you know who's still around? The white Samuel L. Jackson, Nicole Kidman. <laughs> Because oh she my. is in everything, baby. Oh she my. is working. No kidding. I cannot wait for Baby Girl. Cannot wait for it. The trailer looks great. And honestly, I might have to revisit Beach Rats, which I did not love initially, just because I love Harris Dickinson in everything else that he's done. Yeah. It might make me love Beach Rats all over again. I'm a fan of that movie. I thought it was excellent. So, as we know, you've been wrong before. So, well, I have. Hopefully, yes, hopefully you'll be correct this time. <laughs> And we are back with our favorite segment of the episode. It is Keep It. Lewis. Yes. What's, what are you keeping this week? Okay, mine is going to be Monsters, the Lyle and Eric Menendez story. Here's the thing. Not that it's not entertaining. I think everybody watches this show the entire way through, in fact. But at the same time, Ryan Murphy, I think we have to be conscious of making movies that remind me of what they're making at the end of the movie May, December. Um... <laughs> There is not a single second where I'm watching this movie where I'm like, this is not even close to the reality of what happened with the Menendez brothers. Down to the looks and down to their dynamic. There's implications in this show that they had an incestuous relationship. 
Nothing about that ever occurred in real life. There's no record of that. Um, and you, you just, it feels like this was such a lurid tabloid story at the time. And I feel like it, Ryan Murphy always like tasks himself with the, uh, with the um, challenge of making it even more lurid, like making it even cl less close to reality than your perception already is. And watching it, I, I guess there's entertainment value from it, but it's just another show of his where after you watch it, you know, you're not getting anything. It's like a bad, it's like bad, true crime, which is to say, I'm like, okay, now I'm aware of this crime and that's all I've gotten out of this. It's just something that maybe I think would be more palatable as a movie, but as like a, a eight episode show where like, now we learn about this character and then this person had this crazy motivation that's also not true to life. Just a big waste of time. Ryan Murphy, Ryan Nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Again, there are projects of his that I like, and I will st stick my neck out and say, when the Madonna biopic comes, I actually hope he does it. I think he will do justice to her life. Icons like that, people he reveres, yeah. sure. I think that Ryan Murphy should also just investigate true crime stories from the past. I think that this sort of need to excavate the recent past, the 90s, is, I mean, you want something that's still in recent pop culture, still fresh in people's minds, right? But mm -hmm. these people are still alive, you know? Yeah. And it just feels gross. This feels just as gross as the Dahmer shit um, when you were sort of, you know, abusing those victim stories, you know? And I feel like... Tell some story for the fucking eighteen hundreds, you know. Do the fucking Lizzie Borden story. That's what write we a want. story about. Okay, write about Lizzie Borden and her sister fucking. I don't yeah. know. Okay, <laughs> who cares? Yeah, who cares if who cares if you write that? You know, it they're is dead. Weird. It's weird to hear like one of the Menendez brothers speak out and be and and think to myself, finally someone's making some sense. Like I can't <laughs> be thinking that. Okay, it's it's disorienting for me. I Ira, will say. Oh. That I will say that the worst thing I experienced all weekend was just entering any room and someone either saying, have you seen the Menendez or do you want to talk about Chapel Room? So that is what <laughs> Ryan Murphy has done to me. <laughs> the two topics in popular culture. <laughs> Ira, what is your keep it this week? So my keep it this week goes to Ellen DeGeneres' comedy special. Oh, I saw that myself. Yes. Comedy special <laughs> is a stretch. Both in comedy and special. Both words. Now, listen, I want to give my good sis a shout out. I did laugh a few times. When she gets into that Bob Newhardy timing where she's talking about yeah. whatever, um, um, not the sweatpants part. That part made me groan. But like the other, oh, the, like how she's disappointed in pigeons, like that kind of old yeah. fashioned dry humor. It's amusing. Yeah, and listen, when she's doing some of her acerbic wit in the beginning, uh, talking about scaring people at work and some of that stuff, I think it's funny. She has great comedic timing, but I just don't get the impetus to have a comeback special after all of the brouhaha, and one, come back and pretend I was kicked out of Hollywood. Girl, you're rich. You have an estate. And you got a Netflix special. Right. You, you weren't kicked anywhere. You're fine. And I'm <laughs> yeah. sure all of your celeb friends were still kicking it with you. Right. Okay? Right. Portia like, comes you out kicked... on stage at the end. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You weren't kicked out of anywhere, girl. You just retreated. Uh, you could have just turned off the noise, you know? Um, two, to have your comeback special be the like first few jokes, me hearing you talk about parallel parking... Girl, what are we doing here? Are you you were like a you're like a bad comic in um Marvelous Mrs. Maisel or something. It, I thought that's what was confusing about that special. There were it was like extremely quaint at times where it was talk it was like jokes that could have been from 1977 or something. Um It was a that, suburban mom doing it felt like a suburban mom doing her first stand-up set right like at at the local comedy club and it was just like why are you making jokes about parallel parking? Why are you making jokes about what's dry cleaning? This is not new, fresh comedy in 2024. Especially if it's going to be a comeback special. It feels like there should have been some more urgency there. But then also, when she gets into the quote-unquote being kicked out of show business, and then there's this raucous moment where she just says, well, I'm a strong woman. It's like, if you're not going to like even begin to explain what happened or like why you're perceived the way you are, like what is 
what are we doing here at this special? It felt like she was using the rhetoric of like a strong woman to like cover a multitude of sins kind of. And so that made it extremely uncomfortable, even as the audience gave her a standing ovation for literally over a minute. Talk about something that feels like it was out of Megalopolis. What? Like, it was like <laughs> the amount of uh, 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 applause breaks in this show is actually well documented online. But the this particular standing ovation made no sense. It, it, it was it was weird. It felt like it had been chopped together, too, um, that part to make us root for her again or something. Anyway, it's a, it's a very what? weird special. It's weird. White women clapped less for Oprah handing out cars, okay? <laughs> like, the, like the, the standing ovations were insane in this special. And the, just, just the aw shucks this of it all. Yeah. I don't know. I wasn't expecting her to be edgy. I wasn't expecting her to come out and really sort of dyke it up, give us pussy-licking jokes, you know, something yeah, like right. really sort of racy. But I don't know. There has to be something more to say about being a lesbian in 2024 uh, who's gone through what she went through in the industry, then, hey, let's talk about parallel parking. I, I mean, truly, if she had just ended this special by saying, like she used to say on her show, be kind to each other and also go fuck yourselves, that would have been great. Give me some yeah. moment of, of, of nastiness to offset this, like, namby pamby thing you do yes that would have been lovely